Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Khalil Jahshan. I'm executive director of Arab Center, Washington, D.C. And I would like to welcome all of you to this uh, special uh, panel and discussion focusing on the GCC crisis in context. The Gulf crisis, as uh, all of you know very well by now, uh, started essentially on June 5th, uh, 2017, uh, when four countries, uh, namely Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Egypt, imposed a boycott against fellow GCC member, uh, the state of uh, Qatar. The boycott and the, uh, had political, diplomatic, and economic dimensions. Uh, the boycotting quartet, as we all remember, and their supporters justified their drastic measures against Qatar based on a long list of charges, including but not necessarily limited to support uh, of terrorist groups, undermining GCC security and stability, financing of terror in the region, harboring uh, radical dissidents, and maintaining a very close relationship uh, with uh, Iran. This was not the first such crisis between GCC members, but this time it quickly deteriorated into the most intense and pronounced dispute uh, in the Gulf, uh, threatening the effectiveness and the very future of the GCC itself as a regional mechanism or institution. Many questions have been raised uh, since the inception uh, of this crisis, with few uh, authoritative answered, answers uh, offered to set aside uh, the points of contention between the parties. Uh, you know, in a way, the, the debate uh, society that emerged uh, from this crisis uh, has been somewhat in the eye of the beholder. Uh, you make one argument here, you make a counter argument there, but it doesn't seem like any side uh, is getting the upper hand in terms of convincing uh, the other side, if you will, to sit down and talk about a political exit uh, out of this crisis that seems to be hurting everybody in the region. Some of these questions are well known uh, to an audience like uh, this one, uh, very experienced with the politics of the region. Uh, but let me just mention a few of these questions uh, that will be the focus of our uh, speakers uh, during their presentations and during the uh, Q&A uh, that will uh, follow. What are the internal uh, dimensions of the crisis within Qatar? What are the in internal issues uh, with regards to this crisis in, in the state of Qatar? Two, what are the regional uh, dimensions of intra-Gulf economic, political, and security uh, relations? What are the legal dimensions of the conflict, particularly in terms of the charges and counter charges leveled at, at each other. And finally, is there a political way out of this crisis? Does mediation thus far led by the state of Kuwait and the United States still have a chance to defuse the situation and avert further deterioration in the region? To help us analyze and answer uh, these questions, we have a very impressive panel, if you don't mind me saying so, of uh, three great friends uh, from the University of uh, Qatar, uh, very well-known academicians and analysts and writers uh, in different uh, specialties uh, in, uh, in, in the region. And they will be uh, speaking in the order that I will be uh, introducing them. First, we will begin uh, with Dr. Mohammed Al Misfer, the in informally declared, I just declared him the dean of, of this uh, delegation. So, <laughs> welcome, uh, a good friend and uh, also uh, uh, advisor in many ways to the uh, Arab Center uh, in, uh, in Doha on issues. Uh, he's been well known constant kind of figure of, uh, of wisdom and academic expertise with regards to Arab nationalism uh, throughout the, the past uh, four or more uh, decades. And we appreciate all the writings and the lecturing uh, that he has done on this. He's a professor of political science at Qatar University. He published several books and research uh, studies in the field of political science 
and particularly uh, pertaining, as I said, uh, to issues on Arab uh, nationalism. He's a regular contributor to Qatari and Arab newspapers, and particularly uh, academic uh, journals and magazines in, in the region. Uh, as I mentioned, he advises the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies uh, in, in, in Doha. And Dr. Al Misfer uh, holds a PhD degree in political science uh, from New York uh, University. After uh, Dr. Uh, Al Misfer, we will move to uh, Dr. Mohammed Al Khulaifi, who is the Dean uh, of the College of Law at uh, Qatar uh, University. Uh, Mohammed, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, is also Associate Professor of Commercial Law at Qatar University. He received his uh, law degree from Qatar University, graduate degree in law masters, and JSD from the University of California at Berkeley in the United States. He has published several scientific peer-reviewed research papers in the field of commercial law and received a fellowship from the Institute of International and Regional Studies at uh, Georgetown University uh, in, in, in uh, Qatar and uh, for the academic year 2013-2014. Uh, he will be focusing more uh, as, as uh, Dr. Al Misfer will discuss kind of the internal and the political dimension of, of the crisis. Uh, Dr. Al Khulaifi will be uh, talking uh, more on the kind of legal uh, components uh, of, of the uh, crisis. Uh, and then uh, basically we will um, uh, move to the uh, Last but not least, a speaker in the panel, Dr. Majid Al Ansari, who is a, a professor of political sociology at the same university, University of Qatar, uh, Qatar University. Uh, Majid Al Ansari is, uh, like I said, uh, not only a professor of sociology, but a researcher at uh, Qatar University. He's also a columnist. For those of you who are familiar with publications in the Gulf for Al Arab Weekly uh, newspaper in Qatar, and prior to his appointment at Qatar University, he served as uh, Director of Financial Resources and Social Development at al Balagh Cultural <coughs> Society, a project manager of, uh, at Eid Charity, and is founding president of uh, Qimam uh, Youth Club uh, in, uh, in, in Qatar. Uh, we regret, e even though we did announce it earlier, that uh, Dr. Reem Al Ansari was not able to join us for health reasons. She got up this morning on the wrong side of the bed. I guess the, the uh, travel and, and the weather uh, must have impacted. Uh, she didn't feel well and she wanted us to express her apologies to you for not being able to join us. So at, at this time, uh, I'm going to go ahead and invite Dr. Al Misfer to the podium up here to make his presentation and uh, would like to also remind you that uh, we will have a Q&A session uh, after all three speakers uh, finish their presentations. They will speak each for about 10 to 12 minutes, uh, and then we'll have about half an hour of uh, Q&A. Uh, that's the reason for the cards and the pencils uh, on your seats. Uh, we will entertain uh, questions in writing, and uh, once you have a question or a comment, uh, feel free to just raise your hand. Staff will pick those up. Uh, and bring him up here so that we can acknowledge uh, your participation uh, in this discussion. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, help me at this time to welcome Dr. and Misfer to the uh, podium. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it might be difficult for somebody for the last 30 years lecturing, writing, talking in Arabic language, and all of a sudden comes before you and deliberate his intervention today, talking about the Gulf crisis in English. So if I make any mistakes with the grammatical or words or uh, anything, please excuse my uh, weakness of the language. Um, Mr. Chairman, as you started, everybody knows that on the 5th of June, last June, the state of Qatar, like the rest of the world, 
the Islamic world, who's observing the spirits of the holy month of Ramadan. It woke up to a stunning and new reality with the neighboring countries announcing a complete and unjust blockade against it through, through severing all diplomatic ties and closing land, air, and the sea roads. The world has reached, has reacted with a shock and disbelief. Today marks 115 days since this crisis has started. And the world continue to be in a state of dismay. However, this time the world marvels at the this at how this small country has weathered with the crisis and emerged strongly against the forces that are trying to isolate it. A look back at the 50, at these 115 days of head spinning events represents an, inter an, an interesting examples of a nation emerge in the midst of the crisis, changing the geopolitical dynamics of the region that it is part of. Qatar has strongly supported the efforts of Sheikh Sabah al-Ahmed al-Jabr al-Sabah, the Emir of Kuwait and continues the support of the efforts in the mediating of the so to solve this crisis with stressing the full so respect of the state of the state of Qatar sovereignty. Qatar has received a positive response and support from the international community regarding its position from the crisis because the blockade countries have not provided any evidence of their allegation against Qatar for the financing, accommodating, accommodating or supporting the terrorism and interfering in other countries' internal affairs. The blocking countries have chosen to escalate the crisis through using, through, through issuing a list of individuals and credible civil society and charity organization that work in the field of humanitarian assistance. Alleging that they are involved in terrorism. However, this country have not provided any evidence to support their baseless claims. Furthermore, the blockade, the blocking countries warned the international business and communities and companies and that they have chosen between conducting business with them or with the state of Qatar. A step that is a considerable a dangerous precedent that would, that would affect the international business working in the Gulf region and the worldwide due to the interlockage of the global business and economy. Ladies and gentlemen, the international community include leaders, politicians, intellectual, civil society leaders, writers, businessmen, and, poly and peace lovers should explain to the world the, Im the impact of this crisis, including the violation of the basic human rights of the people and residents of Qatar and other Gulf Cooperation Council country as well as the violation of international law and breaking and breaching the World Trade Organization Agreement, as well as loss in business due to the unilateral action taken by the blocking countries. Finally, it is our collective responsibility, in particular, that media to reflect the facts regarding the background of the crisis as the accusation are baseless, false, and politically motivated. I thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, audience.
I would like uh, at this time to invite Dr. Mohammed Al Khulafi uh, to make his uh, presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in the beginning, and I would really want to second on what Dr. Musfer mentioned and thanking the organizers for inviting us today to discuss this crucial and very important topic with all of us. Uh, I will touch based on the legal implication of the blockading state's decision from the perspective of the international law. As you all know, that the international law is deemed to be the supreme, the main reference in regulating and dealing with issues related to international affairs, defining the rights and obligations of each state. It also organizes relevant international law matters, including human rights and preserving a human dignity, considering that the individual is a crucial part in the world community. Therefore, the connection between law and international affairs is quite close. And the law, if the law is absent, definitely chaos will spread in the world community and the international practices and conducts will lack the standards and rules. Without any introduction, and as Dr. al Misfer clearly presented some of the facts of this crisis, uh, I would like to directly move on to what types of principles, well-known international law principles that has been clearly violated by the decision of the blockading states. This decision clearly violates, number one, the principle of the prohibition of use or the threat to use force in international relations. And we don't mean here specifically the military force, but there are other types, as the international law scholars have identified in their articles and books, that economic and political and diplomatic pressures are considered also a means of, uh, of violence and acts that threats definitely the international peace and security. The decision of the blockading state has definitely uh, uh, um, violated the principle of non-interference and also the principle of equality and sovereignty. So principle of non-interference clearly identified in Article 2, Paragraph 7 of the Charter of the United Nations, the 13 demands of the uh, 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 blockading state that has been uh, mentioned by the chairman in his opening note, mainly violates this important principle of the non-interference of the internal matters of any states. Equality and sovereignty, yes, because sovereignty is deemed as one of the basic elements of the states in the international uh, as, a, as, as a legal person which means clearly that the state has the full freedom to exercise internal and external affairs with no interference of the others in its exercise. Legal equality between states means that all states are equal before the law, regardless of the strength, the area, or the population it's exercising in exercising its rights. Principle of the conflict settlements through peaceful means is a very crucial and important principle that also has been violated by the blockading states. If a crisis happened or occurred, as we all know, that we should refer to the United Nations Charter, which clearly identifies the ways of peacefully settling this dispute between the countries. It clearly mentioned in Article 33 of the Charter that methods such as negotiation, inquiry, mediation, uh, arbitration and judicial settlement could be mentioned here, although in our case it's been totally abandoned by the blockading states. Also, the, the, the blockading uh, 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 st decision has clearly violated a very important principle, a principle of implementing the international ob uh, obligations in a good faith and not to abandon them by your single will with no reasonable justification. Also, the principle of non-abuse uh, non of using the rights. This crucial principle is, is located in the local legislation, but also has its reflection in the international law as well. The non-abuse of using the right, which means you're exercising the state's rights should not have 
the uh, um, intention of harming the others, or the, or the interest gained as is totally incompatible with the harm caused to the other states. Also, the obligation to respect and protect the human rights and preserving human dignity has been clearly violated also from that decision. Freedoms such as the rights of education, the rights of practicing your religion, worship, the freedom of transportation, the non-discrimination uh, of family members, and also freedom of expression, which has been violated not only by the citizens of Qatar and Al Jazeera Channel, but also uh, touched on the citizens of the uh, blockading st states themselves by sending um, uh, unjustified uh, orders to them by not showing any tolerance to Qatar or the people in Qatar or even the government of Qatar. So the list of violations to the international law does not stop at the main principles of international law or international human rights law but it also exceeds to the international organization where all both parties are uh, uh, involved in, such as the GCC, the Arab League, and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Those three regional organizations has clear laws that the dispute should be settled in a way and reform as agreed between the parties or the members. Also, uh, 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 clear violations of the Chicago Convention and the Convention of the Law of the Sea. The next question would be, what is the legal mechanism? Uh, as a lawyer, we always a we've always been asked this question, so what is next? What, what, what Qatar should do next? In my perspective, actually, in the beginning of the crisis, I list three important mechanisms, which I think, basically, these are the mechanism offered by the international law. The first one, we call it the political mechanism, or the political procedures. Those might involve uh, neg negotiation, diplomacy, and possibly filing some claims within the international organizations. The second uh, uh, types of mechanism should involve or should be related to the human rights. So human rights investigation and should be filed to the, in the International Human Rights Council. And the third mechanism, is the judicial mechanism or the judicial legal procedures. And that might, really, might be related as well to the uh, United Nations and the International Court of Justice. In conclusion, lady, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to end with this. The lesson that I learned from this crisis should be the following. When a state definitely obeys the international law, this reflects the culture of the state of law. This culture is what drives the states to respect the human right and preserve a human dignity. It will also deter the states from violating the rights of the others and from claiming more than its personal rights. It's also a culture that calls for respecting commitments, contracts, conventions, and charters. It makes the states invoke the rule of law in all matters, but it also reflect more rationally in, more, in dealing with the crisis, avoiding errors, maintaining rights, and acknowledging the basis of responsibility and the form of punishments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Al Khulaifi, for your presentation. Uh, and at this time, I would like uh, to invite Dr. Majid Al Ansari uh, to make his presentation. Good afternoon. First of all, let me extend my thanks to the Arab Center and to the organizers of uh, this event. We are here, the, the lot of us and those of us who couldn't make it today, simply because we want to listen and we also want to talk. So uh, this is, for us, this is a very important chance to convey the perception of, uh, of Qatari academics rather than politicians. And we all know that politicians always say the nicest things. But uh, for academics, it's a different story. We, we all have been accused of being biased, of course, and, and there is certainly a healthy bias. But we also would like to say that there's, there are more deep roots to this issue that need to be understood 
within this academic framework. So please allow me to use this time to answer a simple question which I think a lot of people around the world and even in the region, in Qatar, in Saudi Arabia, in the UAE, in all other countries, why this crisis happened. Usually, there's a direct reason behind crises of this magnitude. When there's a blockade against a state by other states, when there are political military implications such as the ones we saw, there's usually a very obvious direct reason. Well, obviously in this uh, crisis we don't have a direct answer to that question. However, let me first start by telling you what this crisis is not about. It is certainly not about terrorism. If Saudi Arabia and the other blockading countries want to target Qatar as a supporter for terrorism, one only has to point to the reports published by the State Department here in Washington about support for terrorism and terrorism funding around the world. And one would see that Qatar is certainly not on top of the list, but some of the blockading countries certainly are. It is not Iran. Qatar is not Iran's biggest friend in the region. Actually, it's, there is an antagony between the two. We know that Qatar and Iran at, are at odds in Syria very strongly. We know that since the uh, Saudi embassy incident, Qatar has pulled its ambassador from Tehran. And at the same time, we know that the number one economic partner, or business partner of Iran in the region, and uh, a, uh, a breathing point for uh, Tehran is uh, Dubai in the UAE. So it's certainly not Iran, and it's certainly not meddling uh, in the affairs of other countries, as Qatar is usually accused of, because we can see now uh, Saudi and Emirati uh, hands in Libya, in Yemen, in Syria, not to say if this is a good or bad thing, it's just to say that, say the obvious, which is that there is a presence for these countries in other countries where they are actively working towards changing the status quo or returning to the status quo in these countries. So what is this crisis about then? Well, there is no simple answer to this question, but we have to understand the whole context behind it. There, are, there is a maraud of questions, there's a maraud of reasons that can be broken down to certain aspects. First of all, there is an economic aspect, and the economic aspect has different uh, versions. For the UAE, it's basically like having two Singapores right next to each other. So for the original Singapore, uh, they formed an economic model there of being a business hub in the region, of receiving international investment and applying this international investment and, in, and providing a framework for businesses to operate and you know, the port which would be the hub for import, export uh, around, uh, around the globe actually. However, Qatar with its newfound wealth after the gas and LNG uh, production started thinking, well, why not Qatar? And therefore, there has always been antagony about this issue, which is having these two countries doing exactly the same thing economically right next to each other. For Saudi Arabia, it's different. The economic situation, the economic model in Saudi Arabia is completely different than that of Qatar. But there's a problem there. Qatar is not politically in the same group, quote unquote, uh, with Saudi Arabia when it comes to regional issues. It doesn't look the same economically. And uh, GDP is certainly higher, and uh, there's, a, there's more income to be distributed to the people. While in Saudi Arabia, poverty is not unseen, and there's certainly a lower personal income barrier there. And therefore, this provides a dilemma for Saudi Arabia, because the question of the Saudi people will always be, well, why not us, if we are making as much money as Qatar, then why aren't we as individuals getting a share of that money just as the Qataris are getting? And there's also an aspect of internal politics. And again, there's a different issue here between the UAE and Saudi Arabia, but they converge a little bit, which is basically there's a, change, a generational change in the region, in the leadership. So in Saudi Arabia, it's always been a game of musical chairs. Everybody was waiting for the music to end on the horizontal system of uh, the hair parents. So the brothers, the sons of uh, Abdul Aziz, would get their turn to become king. However, at one point in history, this would end, right? Because inevitably, the brothers will become old and die. And therefore, they'd, you'd have to move to a second generation. Now, how would that be? 
There was never a consensus on how that can be. And there was never a consensus on who would start from the second generation. So there was always this game of musical chairs. And when the music stopped, that would be the point where no more vertical passing of power. There would be, sorry, horizontal. There would be a vertical passing of power. And I think in Saudi Arabia, King Salman and his son found this to be the point in time when this can actually happen. And therefore, this needed a lot of legwork to make it stable and to make it durable. And we can talk about how this is in the Q&A uh, part of this uh, session. Uh, same thing is in, uh, in a different way in, uh, in the UAE. There was a very peaceful and very easy change of power in Qatar. In the UAE, there's a different story. There's a president of the UAE who nobody has seen for a while, who doesn't actually do uh, I mean, his part as, as president of the country. And then there's the heir apparent of one of the states, which is Abu Dhabi, which is referred to usually in the Western context as MBZ, um, Mohammed bin Zayed. And he's actually taking uh, all the leadership role in the state. And the difference between the two models actually also creates a problem. Why isn't there an easy, an easy and, and a change like the one in Qatar in the UAE? Now, there's also a need for a political win. We know that the Saudi and UAE projects around the globe haven't done fared very well. The war in Yemen is dragging on. Syria, nothing happened in Syria. Libya, the problem is being exacerbated. So there are a lot of non-finished projects going. There was a need for a quick win. And I think, for reasons that we can talk about later, these two nations thought that Qatar would be the quick win they need to establish their power in the region. When it comes to regional issue, there's always uh, an attempt to push the narrative of liberals against Islamists, seculars against Islamists. But this narrative, in my opinion, is completely flawed. It is actually people aspirations versus oppressive governments. And we all know that Ed Ortega, the ambassador to the UAE in Washington, said very, very clearly, stable, uh, that the future in the eyes of the UAE and Saudi Arabia is stable, secular, uh, states in the region, which of course translates in Arabic into oppressive, non-Islamist uh, regimes. And therefore, there, oh, there's always been this problem between the two pillars in and, 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 and the region, Qatar and Turkey on one side and Saudi Arabia and the UAE on the other. Another issue, and I will try to finish as soon as possible because I think I took more time than everybody else. Uh, the other issue here is the matter of the international partner in the region. So, and the, the regional leader, if you will. The regional leader problem is that you have very rich, stable states right next to each other that all have international alliances with the West and especially with the United States. However, there's no apparent leader except for the size and magnitude of Saudi Arabia, which gives it a, natu a natural geographic uh, geopolitical leadership uh, of the region. However, now we know, for example, that UAE, Qatar have gained a lot of prominence in Washington and in other, uh, in London, in France, in Germany. And therefore, there's always conflict about there. And finally, there's a cultural issue there. I don't know, I mean, many of you, of course, will know this uh, if you understand the, the Arab language, but we always call Saudi Arabia, we used to call Saudi Arabia at least, as Shaqiq al Kubra, the elder sister. The elder sister narrative is very important in understanding the region because it basically says it's, it's a very traditional household where the elder sister is the one that takes care of decision making and everybody respects the elder sister because nobody wants to make the elder sister angry and everybody has to show that respect very visibly. However, when countries like Qatar say, no, listen, wait a minute, we are the rebellious teenager in this narrative. So we'd like to go out late at night, we'd like to go and see our friends, and we'd like to do whatever, we'd like to think the way we'd like to think without having to refer to the elder sister. This is, of course, problematic culturally. And finally, there's an issue of the culture of tribal elders. We all know that the GCC states, not very long ago, were actually tribal emirates, where the tribal norms drived pol politics in the, in the region. This hasn't changed that much. One would like to see it change, and one would, would like to say that we have moved from uh, that state to a very uh, 
governmental and uh, advanced uh, state of government, but this hasn't happened a lot. There's still this narrative in the back of our minds that there are tri tribal elders in the region, and there's a problem. When you have six tribes, one of the tribes would have to dominate. So there's always an attempt of establishing who the tribal elder is, and whomever wants to stray from the model of the tribal elders, meaning for the whole system of the tribal elder culturally, is making a problem for the rest. The more non-tribal you are, the, the more problematic you are to those who would like to stay at that model and not depart from it. And finally, of course, then there's a, a very easy question to ask in, in answer to that question, which is, why now? So if, the, if all this situation occurred uh, all through the history of the region, then why exactly now? Well, I will end with two words. It's Donald Trump. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Majid. Uh, thank you all uh, three for uh, great presentations. I think you have uh, answered some of the questions that uh, uh, we have been attempting uh, to answer uh, for several weeks uh, or several months uh, at the center with regards uh, to, to this conflict. It's time now to engage in a conversation uh, with our speakers, so it's your turn, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there are cards again on your uh, seat. Uh, please write your name and uh, your question and uh, raise your hand, staff will pick him up, and I'll be more than glad to read him if you uh, write him clearly enough for me to decipher. And uh, if you want them addressed to a specific uh, speaker, please indicate uh, that. Thank you. Dr. Safi Hamad, Center for Egyptian uh, American Relations. To Dr. Al Misfer and uh, colleagues, uh, has Qatar tried to reach the Arabs of America, the three million Americans of Arab origin, and the seven million uh, Muslim Americans to explain uh, their position? Uh, and if not, why not? Communicating يعني, with the Al Jaliyat Al Arabiyya Al Islamiyya in the United States. Uh, I'm sorry, I will speak in Arabic. Go ahead. يعني يبدو لي إنه إذا فهمت السؤال جيدا عن الحديث عن الجاليات العربية والإسلامية الموجودين في الولايات المتحدة كيف وضعهم أو كيف التعامل مع هذه الظاهرة صحيح؟ فإذا كان ذلك فأنا أعتقد أن المطلوب من هؤلاء الناس جميعا أن يدركوا جيدا ما هي الأهداف الحقيقية وراء هذه الدول الثلاثة التي قامت بحصار قطر هناك أسباب يعني قضية قد لا يفهمها الكثير من الناس if, Allow me if I understand the question correctly uh, I would like to say that um, the Muslims, the Muslim Americans and the Arab Americans should rather uh, try to understand the goals and the reasons for the uh, for the for these boycotting. That question, yeah. Oh, yeah. All three of you. <laughs> well, of course, I'm I'm not a government spokesman, and I certainly don't know the the military plans, which are usually quite secretive to how they're going to deal with such an issue. But I think it's very important, as the Minister of Foreign Affairs yesterday actually said in Paris, uh, in the uh, French Council for Foreign Relations, that. Um, it's a matter of having partners who believe that such an action would be so deplorable and, and cannot be done. This is the main security uh, that, that Qatar is working towards. Qatar has strengthened its military partnership with various uh, countries. I mean, I know everybody talks about the, the, the pact with Turkey, but we also need to uh, ma make sure that we understand that French, British, and US troops uh, did uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, military maneuvers, I think they're called in English, uh, in, in Qatar during the, the siege. So Qatar is attempting to protect itself through the international community, and certainly it is always alarming when you hear 
a, uh, a figurehead of a nation uh, saying that he will actually annihilate another on, uh, on the podium of the General Assembly, but I think the, the international uh, mo moral guidelines will apply when there is any struggle of the sort in the region. Also, the country's military has been working towards much of the advancement. We've seen uh, pa uh, military uh, deals with Russia, with France, with uh, the UK, and with the United States, so I think the, I think the government, who I don't speak for, <laughs> Uh, I think they're doing a good job in that uh, aspect, at least. Dr. Nusfer? يعني من الملاحظة الذي نراها الآن أنه لن يكون هناك تدخلا عسكريا وإنما التحريض على عملية القبلية واستدعاء نظام القبيلة وتحريضها على أن يكون هناك الخصام أو أي صراع قادم بين قطر وجيرانها سيكون صراع قبلي وليس عسكريا رغم أن القبيلة يعني هي أصلا عسكرية لكنها ستلبس ثياب مدنية ويقال أنه صراع قبلي كما حدث في المرة السابقة ولنا تجربة في ذلك في موقعة الخفوس قيل أنه صراع قبليا وليس عدوان عسكري I don't believe that there will be a military inter inter intervention per se, uh, but rather there will be uh, in, uh, more incitement for a tribal conflict. And um, as has happened in the past, um, this, this uh, uh, inciting for uh, uh, internal conflict between the tribes is, is going to be highlighted more. Okay, the next question is from Mihailo Savic from the Embassy uh, of the Republic of Serbia. Uh, how much has the crisis affected the private sector, especially in terms of foreign investments? Or oh, addressed to all three speakers. There is a pan economist on the panel, so I, <laughs> everybody's trying to. <laughs> yeah. Can I elaborate on this a little bit? Please. Um, so I don't have hands-on information about this, uh, although I follow up some um, um, uh, media channels, I guess, and um, a few um, uh, news have, has reached me that uh, that the country is are in the process of uh, emitting and um, uh, changing a set of economic legislations that will help and support the idea of magnetizing foreign investments in Qatar. I, I, I'm I touched the, I somehow rephrased the question to be a little bit legal. Uh, that uh, the uh, current investment in Qatar is uh, quite good, although I think there are more uh, legislative uh, um, questions uh, and challenges has been raised in, uh, lately. Uh, that's why there is a set of uh, new legislations will come into the country and invite even more foreign investors in the state of Qatar. Can I just add yeah, one thing? Um, uh, I'd like to answer that question as a consumer rather than you know, as an expert on anything. A lot of people have been saying that there has been change to the markets and people cannot find food and so on. As a consumer, I didn't feel the impact of the siege by anyhow. I mean, there is these little subtle differences where you would uh, you'd be looking for a certain type of milk, you wouldn't find that brand. But the, the markets have uh, worked quite uh, visibly in a very easy way during the, the siege. Yes, uh, we all know, of course, import and export now is, is quite, uh, at least export, of uh, essential goods is not as cheap and is certainly not as easy. But the state has subsidized uh, such uh, businesses and eased some uh, the legal framework to, uh, to make it easier for, for businessmen and for uh, companies to, uh, to import whatever they need and, uh, and export whatever they need. So I, as a consumer, I have to say I have not seen a big burden on the private sector when it comes to the crisis. أنا أعتقد اقتصاديا كل المنطقة تضررت لا جدال في ذلك هناك أزمة في داخل السعودية وهي موجودة على كل الصحافة الآن السعودية والعربية فيما يتعلق بقضايا الاستثمار وقضايا الانحراف نحو بيع شركة أرامكو وأسهم من شركة أرامكو ذلك كله مؤثر ثم أيضا رأينا كيف عملية تقسيط المرتبات أو 
تحجيم دخل كثير من القطاعات الحكومية وبالتالي أعتقد أنه لا شك بأن هناك خسائر كبيرة شملت المنطقة وليست قطر لوحدها على الإطلاق وإنما الكل أصبحوا متضررين مما يجري في مما من أسباب الحصار على قطر. There are some uh, economic uh, problems that are happening in within the Gulf countries, and uh, uh, we've all have read that uh, there are prob financial problems in uh, economic problems in Saudi Arabia, uh, especially with the uh, oil company Aramco, and uh, also there are problems with uh, regulating. Uh, uh, salaries of, of uh, public sector employees. Okay, uh, the next question is from uh, Marina Ottoway from the Wilson Center. How does the blockade help countries solve problems they face? I see uh, economic competition, uh, but issues of succession, for example, addressed to Majid. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. <laughs> How does the blockade help countries solve problems they face, yeah. particularly with regards to uh, ah, economic okay. competition Sorry, I, yeah. and issues of succession that I think you mentioned? Yeah. Uh, the issue of succession in Saudi Arabia is basically a, a matter of, of, of need for a demon. And, you know, countries rally around leaders when there's a uh, conflict and there's a need for a real conflict in the region. This is one thing. They've tried to do this but, with Iran, but Iran is, is quite a, a big country to chew if you want to make that your demon in, the, in such a, a problematic situation. Qatar, at least in the eyes of Saudi Arabia, was an easier target. This is one thing. The other thing is that there is a, uh, or there was at least, a relationship between the Emir of Qatar and the previous heir apparent. And this, I think, is the main issue. And, I think this would, would answer the question more fully. Uh, and that relationship was always a positive relationship. Hamid bin Naif, the, the old heir apparent who was ousted by uh, King Salman a while ago, during the crisis actually, had a very good working relationship with the Emir of, uh, of Qatar, visited Qatar various times. He was a contact person between Qatar and KSA. And for somebody like Salman, uh, King Salman and uh, his uh, heir apparent at the moment, this would be a threat, certainly, and, and cutting that line and using the narrative within the, the royal family, the Saudi royal family, that he's an operative of, uh, of Qatar was quite useful. Although, of course, we all know that as her parents, as both were her parents at one time, Hamid bin Naif and uh, Sheikh Tamim have a, personal, a good personal relationship, but this is certainly a justifiable relationship as, as two high officials or, or uh, second to monarchs in, in their own respective countries. I hope this answers the question. All right, the next question is for Dr. Khulaifi um, from uh, Kaila Elias, uh, Portland. Uh, what, if any, legal implications come from the original hack against the Qatari news agency? Um, yes, I purposely decided not to talk about the hack. Um, uh, was in mind that Dr. Reem, the, the absent member in the panel, would be here and because she was specialized, actually, in that area. Um, the hack... I need a whole lecture actually to talk about the the, the full legal implication behind the, the whole story. But um, briefly, we can say that this is the starting point of the crisis. The, the hack is basically what uh, made everyone around the world actually to know that there is a, a problem occurred in the region. Um, the 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 um, I think the uh, the government of Qatar has taken a very uh, s uh, strong move in terms of um, uh, following up with the um, uh, legality behind the the hack, and, um, and the public prosecuting office has also took a very serious step of how to find this, um, um, uh, you know, and, and trace the um, uh, the person in charge. Um, uh, generally, I think that the um, uh, Qatar need to learn from that lesson, and um, and and changing and developing the uh, the concept cybersecurity is something important. Even His Highness mentioned that in the uh, United uh, Nation in his speech. Uh, so I think the, definitely the development of uh, cybersecurity within Qatar is something that all institutes will will look at and and will focus on. All right, for Dr. Al Misfer from Dr. Al Qassab. Uh, could you comment, please, on the negative role played by Egypt in this crisis? 
معلأس... Or positive role, if you so choose. مع الأسف الشديد مصر هي الشريك الذي دخل من أجل الاستفادة من هذه اللعبة كلها. هي ليست معنية بالخلاف الخليجي الخليجي على الإطلاق. وفي نفس الوقت يعني النقاط الثلاثة عشر التي طرحت كانت كلها تصب في صالح مصر عن طريق التعويضات ودفع الضرر أيضا الأضرار الاقتصادية التي لحقت بمصر السؤال عندي وعند كثير من الناس ما هي الأضرار التي لحقت بمصر من قبل قطر هي المحاصرة وهي بعيدة في أفريقيا ونحن في آسيا وليس لها يعني لكنها زج بها في هذه القضية بوصفها أكبر دولة عربية وهي القادرة على تحريك بعض وسائل الإعلام وغيرها من أجل إرباك الساحة بأنه عندهم أنصار كثير من العالم العربي وأكبرها مصر الشقيقة الأكبر وليس الشقيقة الكبرى شكرا Unfortunately Egypt was put into this a uh, whole mix of uh, uh, and crisis um, so that um, it can uh, uh, benefit a little bit from from uh, fi financial uh, has a to get a financial compensation uh, given uh, how uh, deeply it's been impacted financially and um, uh, Egypt does not really gain anything because it's so far away it's in Africa and um, it's very unfortunate that uh, the biggest sister country in the region, Egypt, has been uh, put, uh, uh, has entered this this crisis. Uh, this question is addressed to all two uh, uh, members of the panel. And uh, is uh, the flow of gas uh, shipments between Qatar and the UAE still ongoing? Yes. yes. All right, and uh, that's a quick, short answer. And uh, let's see. Um, Until the end of the contract, basically. Yeah. I don't know. Afterwards, the negotiation will carry on. But uh, but Qatar is always fulfilling its own obligations mentioned within the contracts between. The this countries. person who I usually don't read uh, cards that do not have names on him, and this one in particular has like five questions. Uh, so we have to, this, I, I read one, I'm going to read another one. Uh, the role of uh, basically uh, Al Thani dissidents is being kind of highlighted uh, by some of the boycotting uh, countries. What role do they have? Like particularly we heard about this conference in the UK and, and, and other things. Do they have any role at all, any legitimacy, any support? Well, we're talking here about uh, especially two individuals. Sheikh Abdullah bin Ali Al-Tani and Sheikh Sultan bin Nishim. Abdullah bin Ali, of course, was the visible face for a while now since the Hajj uh, crisis, and he was uh, reported to be a mediator between Qatar and Saudi Arabia for the Hajj issue, and then suddenly he was transformed into a political dissident who was to replace the, uh, the current emir. Of course, for both of them, for him and Sheikh Sultan, they haven't been in Qatar for a while. Sheikh Abdullah bin Ali has been out of Qatar for four years, and he had a uh, financial dispute with, the, uh, with some members of the government, apparently, and he demanded uh, some reparations, and he, the, through the legal framework, he was refused, and therefore he kind of left the country abruptly and refused to uh, return, although members of his, his family, his immediate family, tried to convince him to return. And I think he was used during this uh, crisis. Uh, same is about Sultan bin Sultan Sultan Nishim has a big project in Riyadh. By the way, both of them have very viable businesses in Riyadh, in, or in Saudi Arabia. Abdullah bin Ali has a small, uh, uh, or a big estate in, uh, in Hail, in the north of Saudi Arabia. And he has a lot of business endeavors there. And Sultan bin Nishim has had this big project, 30 billion Riyadh project, which is roughly 10, 10 billion uh, US dollars in Riyadh, which failed miserably, and he, he fell, t fell into debt. And apparently, he asked the government to pay his debt, and they refused. And he moved to Paris to avoid legal 
uh, action against him. There's a third person who a lot of people didn't hear about, who talked just one time and was used as, as a supporter of Sheikh Abdullah bin Ali. Uh, he's wanted for murder in Qatar, and right now he's in the, in the UAE. So you can see, I mean, I'm only saying this because I want to see who these people are. They don't have any legitimacy in Qatar. Some, I mean, two of them at least, we never heard of them in Qatar until this crisis started. Their immediate families are certainly not happy with, it, with, with what they're doing. Sheikh Abdullah bin Ali, I think, has two of his sons with him. But the rest of his family uh, and his uh, sons and daughters are in Doha, and they are, at least uh, from, from my personal knowledge, not happy with what's uh, happening. So I do not think they have any, uh, first of all, they don't have any legitimate claim, but also they don't have any legitimacy in the hearts and minds of, uh, of Qataris. And they were, even, I mean, that little respect they had because of their individual basis, they lost completely during this crisis because the way they were portrayed in Saudi and uh, UAE media was actually quite negative for them. Abdullah bin Ali had to sit down while a poet badmouthed Qatar as a country and then the royal family as a whole and then his grandfather. And he had to clap in front of uh, King Salman applauding the, uh, the poem. This kind of thing actually just ruined any chance for these two people to, to have any kind of legitimate uh, claim in the future. Okay, the next uh, question is from uh, William Lawrence, uh, George Washington University. Qatar's legal and humanitarian case is very strong, but a negotiated solution uh, basically needs a win-win kind of approach rather than a win-lose uh, solution for either side. How can Qatar best address the underlying fears and concerns of the blo blockading countries, what would, be, what would you suggest as a uh, uh, mechanism, Dr. Khulaifi? Um, the human rights case is quite crucial. That's why when I discussed the, um, the mechanism or the legal procedures, I classified as a separate or a second level mechanism due to the fact that it touches on the people of the country, which is quite crucial. Uh, I think that Qatar has took the right path. There is no lose-lose and win-lose. It's, it's about rights and, and, and uh, what, what uh, Qatar should claim. And I think that the country has took the right movement, not only in human rights, but also in approaching other specialized international organizations. I personally believe that the, reflection, the reaction that you can get or the answer that you can get from an international specialized organization is more powerful than any other tools in, 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 in at least uh, uh, um, preserving your rights and making sure that uh, you, get your, you get fully your rights in, in, in any case approached. So uh, the, human rights, the National Human Rights Committee in Qatar plays a very important role by first supporting the government initiative by establishing a committee for compensation in Qatar which I think the committee did a very good role by uh, supporting the, the people who who been actually in harm uh, from, from that blockade and took the legal procedures in front of the international organization. I guess uh, now the case is the International Human Rights Council and I'm quite positive about the reaction that we will receive from that. Okay, last question. Uh, I apologize, I couldn't decipher your last name, but it's Ken, TV producer. Uh, does a country like Qatar, with 250,000 citizens and the presence of uh, foreign troops on its soil for you know, goodwill, for protecting uh, the country, does it really have a foreign policy or does it have to do what it's told, being told? Well, first of all, the number is not accurate. But it's not that much higher. But it's, nonetheless, it's not accurate. Now it's, it's just above 300,000 Qataris. So we do good for reproduction, that's it. Uh, the other thing is, any country around the world has to have a foreign policy. Give me a country around, I mean, the Vatican has a foreign policy. And the Vatican, I, th I think the Vatican has less citizens in Qatar. I mean, I hope the Vatican has less citizens. That, wonderful. So, and it has certainly a smaller uh, geographical, Qatar is not the smallest country in the world. It is not the smallest, it's not the, the smallest population of a sovereign state in the world. There are many countries that fall below that. Uh, and there are 2.5 million residents in Qatar. 
both Qataris and non-Qataris, and the naturalization uh, system in Qatar is very complicated. So don't take anybody who's not an actual citizen to be not somebody who's lived in Qatar for, the, for all of their lives and probably second or third generation. And this is a problem Qatar needs to address, of course, but I'm just stating the fact that Qatar is not that irrelevant, if you will. When it comes to a foreign policy, I think the region needed leadership. And when the big countries in the region, like Egypt and Saudi Arabia, fell uh, from, from grace when it came to their regional roles and what they, they had to do as regional leaders, other countries had to step in. And one of these countries was Qatar. And the foreign policy that Qatar has at the moment is based on, well, of course, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs would answer this maybe differently, but I believe it is based on two important pillars. One pillar is the need for stability and peace in the region through identifying what people are saying, listening to what people are saying, and making sure that the governments, regardless of them being democratic or not, are in, on good terms with the people. Second is that the whole world needs to work together towards peace, and a conflict of civilizations and the clash of civilizations is not a working theory that you can actually apply and use in foreign policy. It is a matter of all of us working together towards the same goal, and this needs for all of us to hear each other, not just say, you have to do this and you have to do that. Because even the United States has been blamed for going into various regions and mandating what the what countries within these regions have to say. And the same goes for Saudi Arabia, same goes for other countries. When your foreign policy is based on going around and telling people who you think are weaker than you to do your bidding, this is not a recipe for international peace. It's a recipe for international disaster. World War II didn't happen because uh, pe people were, had their own foreign policy, their, their, their separate foreign policy. It happened because bigger countries wanted the smaller countries to follow, or they would be annexed. And this is exactly what's happening with this crisis. So yes, to answer your question, sir, I believe Qatar is allowed, should, and very strongly has a foreign policy, and this foreign policy is working not against anybody else. I mean, here I would like to applaud Kuwait and Oman, because nobody talks about what the Kuwaitis and Omanis are doing. They're also advancing the same ideals, the peaceful resolutions. Kuwait has actually, in the Emir of Kuwait, uh, Sheikh uh, Sabah has led the region out of crisis in 2013 and many times before. So many countries in the region would like to have peace. Many countries in the region have their own policies, have their own, sorry, foreign policies and, and foreign uh, policy projects that are based on peace. It is only because the visible is the loudest that we see other countries seem like you know, the only players in the region. All right, thank you very much, uh, all three of you, for your great presentations and for your willingness to engage in conversation with this uh, audience. Thank you to all of you in the audience for being here today. I hope you did enjoy that program. And uh, if anybody, colleagues, are interested in uh, looking at this program, it will be posted on our website, Arab Center Washington, uh, as, as soon as we get the, uh, the tape ready to do, to do so. And uh, there will be also a summary uh, of the whole event that will be posted tomorrow uh, on our website. So we're in touch. You stay in touch. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. <laughs>